Just one. I can't sit around with my brother that year. There are so many things that we are so privileged to have in this country. 
so privileged to be able to live in a country that is is free, that we can worship and serve our God. And these men, whether they were serving in wartime or in peacetime, were all there for the same purpose. We love us. And just speaking for them, I know what it's like to be there. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to stand in a uniform so that that flag is what I can't tell you what it means to me. I hope you appreciate what we have. Thank you, Lord, for every day, every opportunity we have. And thank you for what we have here. For being there to our different things. Uh, do we have any first time visitors? Let's see, first time visitors. Please raise your hand. We have one. Look for right back here, sir. Sorry, it's so good to have you here. Let me tell you how this works. It's real hard. Uh, we have another one in the front right here. All right. We have one more, sir. Right here. Am I missing one? Oh, he's been here. Oh, okay. Well, folks, let me tell you how this works. You're receiving a visitor. I can even have a business card. Please fill out that card. Unless the offer plays it comes around. That way we have a record of record. Other than that, just sit back and enjoy all the grass is going Let's open our service to the word of prayer. On this next show, we thank you for the state. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your son. We gave his life for us, Lord, and we thank you for all those that serve this country. We miss their lives. And Lord, also for those who take their lives. Lord, you are so wonderful. Let's all turn to him. Let's see him. Number 634. Number 634. Let's all turn to him. Let's go for a second and last prayer. <coughs> I ran out of this prayer. I'm sorry. We're going to sing the first thing and the last prayer. So let's all stand for we sing.
Thank you. 
for your service today. We are here today because of you. Now, that having been said, we're going to start on this side at the front. Uh, and as you, as you give us your name and your rank and here's the service order, you can have a seat. And then we'll go all the way around and we'll come back around here to Brother Lee. Go ahead, bro. The grips, go ahead.
had the opportunity to look at some of the license plates in the parking lot. Uh, but we have very, some very special guests with us today, and they are Purple Heart recipients. Uh, and I would like to recognize them today for their sacrifice on behalf of our nation. So if y'all would stand, uh, please, and let us recognize you. Brother Ron Nelson, Brother Bill Wayne, Miss Bobby. I was going to say, I didn't know. That's okay. How about having a round of applause for these men that sacrificed? Now, I'm going to ask one more thing, and that is why I asked Brother uh, David, who had to leave, to dispense with our normal uh, handshaking time, and that is this. If you are a spouse, brother, or sister, to your veteran, would you please stand? Folks, these people sacrificed their time and their love for us. And I thank you. You may be seated. Folks, today, if, if you're enjoying these services, you need to hug these men and women and tell them thank you for what they've done for us, because without their service, we would not be here. So I thank you so very, very much uh, for your service to this great country. So, at this time, I'm going to is it, us, us, is it the champs? Okay. I didn't know whether you were leaving out or... I didn't see Brett. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah. All right, we'll release our champs, our junior church at this time. You're certainly welcome to go over. Six points. I know that brings y'all a great thrill. But, but remember this there are some games to be played yet. So uh, we'll see how we, what we're talking about when we, uh, when we float. Well, we have seen there's a bunch of y'all stuck in casters out there. That's what it is. I had to put that up there, couldn't you? Got your Bibles open with me, please, to the book of John. Uh, the book of John. We're going to continue our series in the, the obvious questions of Jesus. Uh, and we're going to look at some of the questions that he asked. Last week, we, wrote, we talked about, have you not read? We talked about the Word of God and how it should be so very obvious. Uh, some of the things that Jesus talked about. So today, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in John chapter. Hey, it may be very familiar to some of you today, maybe not to some, but uh, if you'll follow along with me, we're going to take it verse by verse. We're going to go through verses 1 through 11, okay? There are two types of people in every church. There are the dead pastors, those are the ones who draw others to Christ, those are the ones who see God's hands in other people's lives, uh, and then there's another group. Is uh, the stone casters. Maybe you've met some of these people or come in contact with them, or maybe you are one of these people. I don't know. They stand as judge, jury, and executioner over the sins of others. You've met them. They're the finger pointers, they're the critics, they're the self righteous accusers of others. Ever ready to highlight your faults while overlooking their failures? Always eager to pull down, always eager to destroy. And so, as we conclude this service this morning, I'm going to ask you that question today. Which group are you in? Because Jesus, in his word, says, 
says there is no middle ground. You're either with me or you're against me. Now, I know some of y'all are saying, well, you know, preacher, I, I you know, I have to use those minutes up on my big button phone because they don't roll over at the end of the month. So I have to talk about somebody. Well, today, hopefully, maybe in our account, you might see yourself. Because let me tell you something, folks, whether you realize it or not, you're on one side of the aisle or the other this morning. The scribes and the Pharisees. Look at me in verse 1 of chapter 8. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came in unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees showed up. But they didn't show up alone. They had somebody in tow. Does anybody know who that lady was? The adulteress. You know, it's funny that the scribes and the Pharisees, they're that group of stone casters. Those are those kind of people who, who believe that they live by the very letter of the law. Is so obvious to everyone. Even the hypocrites who read this say, man, there are a bunch of hypocrites. We look at them and we say, you know, hey, could these people not do anything but find fault? So today we're going to look at the story of a kangaroo court. And it's the same kind of court that convicted our Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on the cross. In the South, the word lynch mob brings a, a, a lot of uh, middle pictures, and that's what this was. It was a lynch mob. Their victim was this fearful, pitiful woman, drunk through the streets, probably half naked. And the reason that I say that is because they said she was gone now in the uh, very act. Amidst the sea of self righteous male accusers. Today, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to talk to Miss uh, Christy Hennigan. She works a lot with people that are involved in this thing we call human trafficking. And it's amazing how many young people are drawn into this lifestyle, not by choice, but sometimes by necessity. And I'm not trying to make an excuse for this lady that was caught in adultery, but I want you to know this, that in Jesus' day, a woman who was not married could not own property. A woman who was not married basically could not support herself. Did she wind up an adulteress or a prostitute because of this life? I don't know. I don't want really to know this. The hypocrites were fast to pull the trigger on it. So today we will look at the inside of a kangaroo court. Verse 20 says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought under him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto her master, This woman was taken in adultery in the very now, when you read this, it, it gives a lot of questions. It, it brings a lot of thoughts to my mind. And, and one of those things is, how is it that they know what's going on behind closed doors? And more importantly than that, how is it that they know what was going on behind this lady's particular You see, I happen to believe as many that I've read that, that very possibly the very men that brought her there, they weren't just her accusers, they were customers. And you see, what you find out of this account is those that want to exact their pound of flesh very often are the ones that are involved in the exact same thing themselves. Can you imagine being drugged to almost certain death if they follow along? While the male partner, somehow or another, mysteriously slithers away. It 
You say, they didn't want her execution. They didn't care anything about her. They wanted Jesus' execution. They really weren't interested in the law. You say, Preacher, how do you know that? Well, Deuteronomy 22 and 22 says this. If a man be fed in life of a woman married to a husband, they both shall be what? They both shall die. Is that not right? What's the problem with the prosecution? There's, where's the other half? Could it be that the other half got away? Because it was someone they knew? Maybe a Pharisee himself? Maybe a scribe? Now, I said that we're after Jesus because they said, they asked Jesus this question. Okay, Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Remember, they're trying to catch him now. Because you see, Jesus right now, they weren't prepared for the answer he was going to get. They thought they had him between a rock and a hard place. And the reason that they did, because if he simply said, stone her, that's what he was now assuming. The role of the judge, political authority, to put her to death that he did not possess. The insurrectionist, uncaring, the heartless. But then, if he, if he goes and he says, let her go, now what is there going to be their response? That you somehow or another believe in immorality? That you're teaching it? That you're condoning it? That you somehow or another are negating the law and its purposes? So Jesus sticks down. Evidently in a posture of, of deep thought. Evidently in a posture of thinking. What he would say now. So now we've seen the defendant. We've seen the prosecution. Now what about her defense? Verse 17 says this. They said unto him, He that was out sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. 
Jesus stands and looks at her accusers dead in the face and words or utter some of the most famous words in all of the Bible. You who are without sin cast the first stone. But you know, I found out something as I studied this passage. There's a there's a subtlety in Jesus' question. Something that doesn't come very clearly out when you read it in the English. Because you see, in the original language, the thought is this. He who is without this sin, let him cast the first time. You see the difference in the question? Now, it's interesting when it becomes personal, isn't it? It's interesting when, when those who would accuse you when it comes down to when the rubber meets the road for them. And I can assure you that these learned men of the law weren't prepared for what Jesus was said going to say to them. Which one of them would be free from adultery? You remember the Sermon on the Mount series we did in chapter 5? Jesus said this, you heard that, you know what? That you commit adultery, you ought to die. And he said, you know what? He says, I'm telling you, if you look on a woman and you look after her, you have committed adultery. Now do you begin to understand the question? Because who of them, who of any of us could say, gee, I never thought it. Never thinks and never has. Jesus stoops down and writes on the ground. What does he write down on the ground? Preachers have debated this for as long as the Bible's been written. I read a scholar who I really liked, and I thought he was right. He said, Maybe the first time Jesus stooped down on the ground, Maybe, maybe Jesus started writing their names. Makes it personal, though. And maybe the second time he stoops down, maybe he begins to list under those names their sin. Dives at home with a sledgehammer, doesn't it? Now, it's interesting because. The jury is going to fall apart. Look at verse 8. Or verse 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. Something happened to the jury who was all that evidence. They could no longer stand. I can see the stone falling from their hand. As they turned around, embarrassed, ashamed, maybe more so because they didn't think it through enough, or maybe more so because they didn't believe that they were talking to the only begotten Son of God. Now, this is interesting when you read this passage because there has to be a verdict. And, and there is a verdict given. The justification is found in verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, I have a question. Woman, where are those thy accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now I want you to notice something that's very specific. 
specific to this passage. Jesus did not condone her sin. She had confessed her sin. She had repented of her sin. And now he had forgiven her. She was going to be restored to wholeness in the eyes of God. in the eyes of the community. John 3 and 17 says this, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 and verse 8, There is there, there, there now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. that verdict in my life. Because, you know, while maybe not guilty of this woman's sin, I'm guilty of sin. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But praise God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to tell you what, folks. This question should mean something to all of us. Because you know what we realize or not? Where are our accusers? Oh, we are accused today, whether you realize it or not. By ourselves. We are accused by others. By Satan himself. We have accused ourselves because oftentimes when there is sin in our life, sin brings destruction to fellowship and it brings shame and guilt. This morning in our Sunday school class, somebody said, What we do when we, when we, we just can't seem to get past something in our life? Well, I'll tell you what we do. We trust God and His promise. Therefore, now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You see, sin pricks the conscience, it bends the heart, and it troubles the mind. And if you don't seek forgiveness for it, it'll catch up with you. You may be in this wee small hours of the night, you may be doing something you think you're getting away with, but brother, let me tell you something. Be sure it will catch up with you. And so when that guilt comes into our lives, sometimes in our lives, we're our greatest accuser. And we're also accused by others. Modern day scribes and Pharisees, they're everywhere. When we come to church, we think that this ought to be the safe haven. Guess what we find? Scribes and Pharisees. Those who are quick to point out your faults and failings. But never think for a moment. Well, I told my wife long years ago when she was so quick to criticize herself. Darling, don't criticize yourself, because let me tell you something. There's enough people out there to criticize you. But believe me, they'll take the job off for you, and they'll take it off with relish. So, preacher, what am I doing with what others criticize me? I'm saying, look, if you haven't received any condemnation or criticism from within inside the church or outside the church, you just do something for God. And you'll find out you didn't do it fast enough. You didn't do it the way they would. You did something. Richard, how do I deal with that? Well, 1 John 1 and 9 comes to my mind. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want you to think there's something about that. 
to see when we're condemning ourselves and others are condemning. We always say, well, but, but the, the, the thought can fly, but we're not good enough. But I want you to notice something in that verse. It don't have anything to do with who I am. My only responsibility there is to confess to him that I was wrong. And then he takes over. Did y'all catch that? He's faithful. You know what? He's faithful even when I'm not. He's just. You know what that means? That means he has the authority. He has paid the price to pay to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But there's one more. Oh, sleep with himself. So. Revelation 12, 7 through 11, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there a place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan was deceived with the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a lot of people saying in heaven, Now we can salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. See, as a child of the king, there's always going to be one that's going to accuse you. And he's going to accuse you day and night. And you know what he said here? He was overcome by the blood of the Lamb. So today, when he sits there on your shoulder and tells you how sorry you are and how you don't deserve eternal life and, and brings up something in your past, boy, you feel about that. Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, one who's paid the price, one who pleads our case on our behalf. So the conclusion is this. God gives us the assurance and the promise of forgiveness. We read this this morning in our Sunday school class, or at least part of it. And I want to read this passage to you. It's in Romans chapter 8. It begins in verse 31. And it says this. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yet rather, what that is written again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see what he's saying is anyone who enjoys a relationship with Jesus Christ 
You're free. You're free not because of who you are, but because of the one who shed his blood for you. Today, where are your Jesus? You see, the answer is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Today, there is one. There's only one you have to answer to, and his name is Jesus. Today, Maybe there's shame over something you've done long years ago that haunts you. Maybe somebody knows something. Today, I want you to know you have freedom in Christ Jesus. Say, but preacher, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Won't you come? It's as simple as opening the free gift of salvation. It's as simple as receiving the price that's already been paid for you. Today, if your life is heated up with shame and guilt and remorse, won't you come? Won't you come to a living walk? He's here. He wants to reach out to you. He wants to love you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to encourage you. Will you stand with me now? Take your hymnals. Turn to page 300. Page 300, will you join me as we pray? Our Father, our God, if we're now in your presence, Lord, as we come to this time of decision, Father, we have to ask ourselves today, Just as you asked that young lady so long ago. Where are our accusers at this morning? We know there are some that are accusing us today. Some, maybe even ourselves. Maybe even like the Pharisees, our own consciences has gotten a hold of us. Lord, there's sin in our life. And Lord, we don't have to live in the fear and the guilt and the shame. We can confess it. Father, for the others that would condemn us. The others who would accuse us. Lord, help us to look into their faces with love and tell them about the one that has forgiven us. Father, we know as long as we draw breath in this life that Satan will be always there. Ever constant. But Father, we know that you're also there. You said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. Father, you're making every step with us. And Lord, we pray for faith to trust you and take you at your word this morning. God, we need you. Father, there's so many here that need you this morning. Help them to find their way to this old-fashioned altar. Lord, to cry out to you, to seek you. Father, for those that are living in shame and, and remorse and, and Lord, all the things they beat themselves up for so long, Lord, won't you allow them to come and taste the living water? Receive forgiveness. Give them a fresh start in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we pray especially for that one that may not enjoy that relationship with you today. They have no happy. Father, want you give them the courage to step out that we might be able to take the words of life and show them that they can have eternal life. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Father, we'll be careful this morning. Make sure that only the name of Jesus receives all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Because we ask all these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus. And my family said with me, Amen. You come right now. You don't have to wait for the music. If God is speaking to your heart, won't you come? He's here. Don't waste this opportunity. Maybe this morning Satan's got you on the run. Maybe, maybe he's got you pushed down from the court. He's beat all the joy out of your life. Won't you come this morning? Jesus take that heavy burden. He paid the price. 
Thank you. 